Uh, take your Bibles, book of Galatians. This will be the last, um, the last lesson I think that I'll visit on this. Um, we've been discussing what Paul brought up in Galatians chapter 2 about false brethren. And the last few Sundays I've given you the exact, I've given you the doctrine of what makes false brethren. This morning I'm going to give you the examples of false brethren. And don't worry, your name's not on the list, on my list this morning, okay? Uh, but what we're going to find out is God's going to give us the names of people from the Bible who ended up being, it, it was revealed that they were fake. It was revealed that they were fake. It was revealed, God made, it, God made us aware of the fact that they, even though they started out saying that they followed God, they didn't. And I've been, this is my 53rd year of life. This is my, let's see, I was saved in 75. I've been in this church since 74. So I've seen people come in, I've seen people leave. Some move, some go to different churches. That's okay, all right? But then some people... They leave and they don't come back. They're not going anywhere else. They just, they just quit. They left. Now, what I'm going to say is this. At the end of my life, it's like me looking back on every day that I've lived so far. It'll be said that it wasn't me holding on to God's hand so much as God holding on to mine. Amen? And that's, God bless you. Um, and it's not, be, and, and that's, that's how I see it. Because there's days I'm weak. I've had weak days this, this week. Weak days. And just down in a pit. Not because I'm doing something wrong. It's just because that's how it's, that's, that's, the, that's what the day brought. And, um, you know, worried about things. Worried about my wife. Worrying about some people in our church that are going through hard times. And, you know, when I hear about things, boy, it just, it bothers me. So... You know, I'm not going to tell you look around because whoever's sitting here now ain't going to be sitting here five years from now. I'm not going to tell you to do that. But I'm just going to give you some examples out of the Bible when, of what God sees out of certain people that's mentioned in the Scriptures and how they ended up. It's not how you start. A lot of people left Egypt that never made it to Canaan. A lot of people. Okay, very few that left Egypt made it to Canaan, very few. So Galatians chapter 2, verse 4, that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seem to be somewhat, and one of the marks is they like for their voice to be heard. They like their name to be out there. And they're all over the internet. Whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Paul didn't follow them. And he didn't follow their doctrine. And he didn't allow anybody else to follow them either. So let's look at, let's look at a name. Follow with me. Turn to Colossians 4. And then we're going to be in Philemon. Uh, which is one of those books you may not read a whole lot out of. 
But Colossians chapter 4, let me just kind of give you the background. And he mentions some names of people that early on followed the Apostle Paul. So Colossians chapter 4, Colossians 4 is the closing chapter of the book of Colossians. And so Paul, at the end of his letter to the Colossian church, this is what he writes, starting in verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom ye received commandments. In other words, Marcus, it looks like Marcus delivered a letter from Paul to the Colossian church. So they knew Marcus. If he come, if he come unto you, receive him. And Jesus, which is called Justice, which are of the circumcision. These only are my fellow workers under the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. And at the time Paul is giving these names out, he doesn't know how they're going to end up, but he's worked with them. They were there at one time in the church with him. Verse 12, Epaphras, which is um, mentioned in another epistle, which is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record, that he hath a great zeal for you, and them that are in Laodicea, and them in Hierapolis. And then he mentions Luke, the beloved physician, which we know he wrote the gospel according to Luke, and he wrote the book of Acts. So Luke continued... The Bible mentions of, and here's how we know this. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God had given the title of holy man to a man by the name of Luke. And God allowed him to write two books out of our Bible. The book of Luke and the book of Acts. Now, from what I think... Luke was the only Gentile writer of the Bible. I don't see Luke as being a Jew. I see Luke as being a, a Greek Gentile. Some, some dispute on that. Can't, can't just nail it down and prove it, but that's just what I think. Luke, the beloved physician, and then he mentions Demas. And Demas, greet you. So Demas wanted his name in on this. Demas goes to Paul and he says... You're writing a letter. Paul says, yes. Demas says, throw my name in on it. Who are you writing it to? The Colossian church. Tell them I said hi. So D Demas wanted his name in here. Demas, greet you. Then Philemon, let me just read this one verse. Philemon, chapter 1, verse 24. Marcus, and then he mentions Aristarchus again from the book of Philemon. Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. So he's mentioned Luke again, and he mentions Demas again, my fellow laborers. Okay, so Colossians and Philemon, he's mentioning, he's mentioning Demas here twice. Okay, then something happens to Demas. So turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 10. In fact, let's, it looks like he says 4. So let's get a little back. Let's get a little back up here. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And I have verse 10. Um. Let's look at, let's see here, that's 1 Timothy. Let me look at 2 Timothy. Yeah, verse, look at verse, uh, boy, yeah, let's, let's go back up to verse 7. The last words of the Apostle Paul on record in this world are in 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy. It's the last letter that he wrote. Paul says in verse 7, I fought a good fight. 
I finished my course. I've kept the what? The, we are justified by faith. We're justified by faith, not by works. If we were to be justified by our works, who would remain of us? None of us. You write that down. You remember that. None of us would. So we're not talking about what they did to keep themselves. It's what they believed. They never stopped believing. Paul said, I've kept the faith. So he says, uh, verse 8, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. This is what we're looking for. Amen? Okay. Verse 9. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. So that he's saying this to Timothy. Now look at verse 10. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Having loved this present world. And here's where we got to be careful, people. I've preached this for years. I've preached this. I'm going to preach it again every now and then. You turn the Word of God, you beat the sword into a plowshare. You let the Word of God plow up the, the hard ground in your life. Every season, if, if, you, go, if you go to farmland... My wife and I, we got the blessing of being able to see this out in Amish country in Pennsylvania in springtime. We were out there, and, and it was just at the time that those Amish farmers were using those teams of mules to physically plow up their ground. And we stopped and watched one of these farmers plow up his field. They do that every season. Every now and then, the Word of God is good to plow up that hard heart that we have. Okay? There's a season for plowing. There's a season then for sowing the Word of God back into our hearts. There's a season of, of waiting and a season of harvest. Okay? Then there's a season then of letting, of enjoying the harvest. Okay? So we're getting into, getting into autumn. We're getting into fall. The harvest comes in. Then you let that harvest then carry you through the wintertime. What grows in the wintertime? Nothing. Nothing. So you rest. God will give you rest. Okay? And then you enjoy the fruits of the labor. So Thanksgiving comes around. That's what happened. Our pilgrim forefathers. You got any candy? I can feel it already. Yeah. And it's butterscotch, just one of my favorites. When I start getting shaky, I know that my mind's fixing to shut down just any minute now. But anyway, you enjoy the blessings of the harvest at Thanksgiving time. And then, well, I should have had you open it for me, too. I got it. Hold on to that. And I've been teaching this for years. Everything goes in cycles. Everything goes in seasons. There's a season to plow. There's a time to eat breakfast. Time to eat lunch. 
And then you gotta have a little snack in between. That's where I'm at now. And then, then there's a season of rest. And then it starts all over again. And we do that which is necessary. If it's necessary to plow up, then we plow up. If it's necessary to sow seed, then we sow seed. If it's necessary to do these other things, then we do them. And a farmer doesn't just farm one year and live the rest of his life on that one year that he farmed. What does he do? Got to do it again. Didn't we just have church last Sunday? So why are we having it again? It's necessary. Didn't we just have church Wednesday? Yeah, but why are we doing it again? It's necessary. Maybe you need plowing up. Maybe you need sowing. Maybe you need harvesting. Or maybe you need rest. So we have the services that we have, and we do the things that we do, and we continue in those things. Okay? Demas stopped. Because his heart was in a different place, wasn't it? What did he love? The world. And look at what it said. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed unto Thessalonica. Crescens to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. He mentions four people that left him. Only Luke is with me. See it? Luke was mentioned back here in Colossians. Luke, the beloved physician. Demas was there, and Luke was there at the same time. So when we look ahead to the last letter of Paul's life, and he just shortly is about to have his head cut off. That's how Paul's life ended, got his head cut off. For what? Living for the Lord. You know what, I got candy in my pocket. That's all right. I don't, it's a sucker. I, don't like, I wouldn't want a sucker in my mouth. It looked like a cigarette. People, somebody say, Hoggard's smoking a cigarette while he's preaching. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring... Mark, Mark hung around. And see, here's... Mark and Paul got into it. Mark and Paul got into it. They, had, they butted heads. They had to separate. But look at what, how Paul is enjoining now. Mark, take Mark and bring him with thee, he, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Even th Listen to this. Even though they agreed to disagree and went separate ways... Paul is saying, I know Mark is still in. And we have the gospel of Luke and the gospel of Mark in our Bibles. Their testimony stayed even under their death that they were still in. Demas let, hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Now, turn to 1 John 2. Let me have that other piece of candy. You open it? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Along with what you're saying, uh, it's Mike, Paul never gave up on them. No. You know, he never gave up on them. They, they just agreed. Right. And they had to part from each other because they got into it. Hey, that stuff happens. That stuff happens. Some people that leave a church, something goes on, and they just can't. Not everybody can get along with everybody. I believe that. Okay? So not everybody who leaves here, it, God's done with them. But some have. Some have. Sometimes I can see it coming. Sometimes I can see it coming. Okay, so 1 John 2, verse 15. Appreciate that, Gary. So you're enjoined here. Here's another part of the scripture. Maybe this is to plow up in your life. Maybe this is to sow seed in your life. 
Maybe this is to bring a little rain down on the seed, or maybe this is to harvest, or maybe this is to rest, but it says, love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. And the more I live in this world, the less I like it. See, in my youth, I was young, foolish. Okay? I'm getting older. And the heartaches of this life set in. And the burdens and the cares of this life come in. And you have to start saying goodbye to people. And I hate it. I hate, I hate this world. Even Elijah. What did Elijah? Lord, it is enough. Now please take away my life. For I'm not better than my father's. Elijah prayed to be taken out. Eventually he was. In, in his rapture, he was taken out. Okay? Now, that is the difference between those who live by faith and those who don't. There was a mega pastor preacher. I talked about him Thursday. Took his own life. Okay, and I'm not his judge, so I'm not going to say anything about where he is right now. But I'm telling you, you've got three examples out of the Bible of men that took their own life by their own hand. Samson's not one of them. Samson did not commit suicide. He was fighting a battle and got killed in warfare. That's a difference. Okay. Judas Iscariot, Ahithophel, who was David's counselor, then went over to Absalom, the traitor. And who did I say? Judas Iscariot, Ahithophel, and King Saul. Saul is on my list of false brethren. Okay? It's not how you start, it's how you finish. Demas loved the present world, so love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father, look at what it says. What does that tell you? Love of the Father is not in him. It's not there. And see, that's, that's salvation. If the love of the Father is there, he plants it in you to not love this world. Don't you hate this world? I hate everything about it. I hate, I hate my participation in it. I hate what it's done to others. And there's nothing here that I want to hold on to. Nothing. It's all lost because when I leave here I'm not taking any of it with me that's for sure including this ugly mug okay whose blood sugar gets crazy should have had a little bit more breakfast anyway if any man loved the world the love of the father is not in him Demas loved the world Demas was a false brother pretending and he wanted his name in there. He was, Tell the Colossians, I said hi. Demas says hi. Okay? But he, he left having loved this present world. Paul says why he left. What that tells you is the love of the Father was not in him. Never was. Okay? Then it says, verse 16, this is where I, I preach this a lot. For all that is in the world, God bless you. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Those three. Anytime you see something three in the Bible, it's either going to be sin, if it's an enemy, or it's going to be the Godhead, if it's good and holy. Okay, that's how we know. Uh, uh, first, first Corinthians 13, for now abideth these three, faith, hope, and charity. Okay, that's from the Godhead. That's not sin, that's from the Godhead. That's how you know the difference. Okay, 
For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. This flesh is awful, terrible about what it wants and what it wants to do. It's awful. The lust of the eyes, unless you're blind, and listen to me, unless you're blind, you have it. The exception are those that are blind. But if you have eyes, even if you can't see out of but just one of them, you have lust of the eyes. And there is no way around it. No getting around it. And the, and the pride of life. So maybe you don't worry about the flesh and you don't worry about the eyes, but you're so full of pride. God can't deal with you. God can't work with you. God has to bring you down. God has to humble you. Usually he humbles us by humiliating us, doesn't he? He brings us down low in front of others. Others see it, and that's where the humiliation brings in. You know, if you fall and nobody saw you fall, then it's no, you get back up and you look around going, well, I'm glad nobody saw that. But when you fall, like on camera, everybody sees that, Okay? That's humiliating. And God, if he loves you, if he loves you, if the love of God is in you, when you do something, God will let somebody see it. And you'll know they saw it. And you'll go, oh man. Okay? That's, that's the love of God being in you to humiliate you, to humble you. So you're not proud anymore. So you don't get cocky. You don't get arrogant. So God can work with you. God can, God can do something with you. God can mold you. You are clay in the hands of God. And He shapes you and fashions you how He wants you. Okay? So, verse 17. Well, uh, let me finish that verse. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof. Aren't you glad? Say Amen. It's going away one of these days. I'm going to get cured of all my diseases. All my sin problems. I'm going to get cured of. Do not put me on life support. What? I don't think so. Why? Am I talking stupid? Okay. I'll hang on to it. I appreciate it though. That was pretty good. Anyway, <laughs> see, God, God will let me get shaky to humble me. I, I don't preach best out of strength. I preach best out of weakness. That's when God comes out of me better. You hear me? I'm, I'm not any better than anybody else ever. I'm the same as. Aren't you glad? Okay? I, and I'd rather have it that way too. I wouldn't want to be some big high and mighty thing looking down on everybody. I wouldn't want that. I wouldn't want that at all. The world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So even your death is not really death. Your death is now everlasting life see it that way think it that way understand it that way okay this world is not getting better it is getting worse i'm coming out with and god helped me to do this yesterday because i tried it all day it didn't work and finally it came out a, a new watchman series coming out today called crisper apocalypse and I watched a video on this the other day, David, and it scared me. Because it, this, this guy in a cartoon format said basically everything that I've thought about what's coming down the road. And when they start, your insurance company tells you, we have a cure for your disease. If you don't take it, we're cutting you off. And no hospital will treat you. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah. China's the test market for CRISPR. CRISPR is DNA editing. Changing your DNA, which is like changing the Word of God to me. That's how it is. That's what it is. It's changing the Bible in you that God wrote for you. You see, God formed you how it pleased Him. God made, Jeff, God made you the way you are. Okay, now I don't know a lot about you. But what I know about you as a man is you're a sinner that needs the grace of God. Okay? And you're not happy. The older we get, we, we're not happy with how we did things in this life. We've got all these regrets and all these piles of stuff that we'd rather not talk about. Okay? But God made you the way you are because He can work with you. God made you that way on his purpose. Same as you, Hyun Mi. Same as me. Same as you, Pam. Same as you, David. Same as everybody else here. You guys on the internet. God made us all the way he wanted us so he could w do his work in us. We are his vessels. The way he shaped us and he made us. And he does that through DNA. And now they want to change it on everybody. And they're going to make it mandatory, not voluntary, mandatory. You have to have it. David's brought up something, and I, I'm glad I'm not done with the series, because now I'm going to have to go with this direction. David brought up the idea, you'll have to have it, you'll have to have certain DNA markers in order to get a certain job. And the book of Revelation, the book in, in Revelation 13, talks about the mark of the beast saying that no man might buy or sell, save he had the what? You said the word DNA marker. A mark in your DNA that they can recognize, okay, you're approved. You, you can bank, you can work, you can buy, and you can sell. We approve of it. And if you can't get it, what are you going to do? Okay? This is what I'm talking about. I don't love this world. I see where it's going, and I want nothing, I want no part of it. Okay? And that's, that's Demas. Demas was a false brother who loved this present world, that was 2,000 years ago, he loved it, decided he loved it more than he loved God, he loved himself more than he loved God, and that tells you, see these two verses work together, you, it completes the picture, that tells you about Demas, that even though he was with Paul for a season, for a season, okay, he didn't stay, it's like, it's like a Cubs player who had his best year in 2015 for the Cubs and left the Cubs in 2015. 2016, they win the World Series. And then this Cubs player says, yeah, I won the World Series. No, you didn't. You left. You went to play for the loser team. You didn't make it. Yet we, we got this one chance to win the World Series and we got it. You left last year. You didn't get it. Right? I had to bring in the Cubs every now and then. Okay? Cubby is our token Cubs guy. Got to have one in the church. Okay? So he's our guy. But anyway, that's how it is. It's not how you start. It is how and if you finish the race. And keep the faith. I got a little time. So turn to Mark 4. And let's go through this very quickly. Who's going to ring the bell? Who's the bell ringer? Do we know? Lisa's not here. Rose is not here. Gloria, is it you? I guess I'll do it in a minute. Mark chapter 4, very quickly. 
Here it is. Here's the four types. Mark chapter 4, verse 14. This is the parable of the seed and the sower. The sower soweth the word. These are they by the wayside where the word is sown. When they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. That's group number one. They had, they had a Bible in their hand. They had part of a sermon that they saw on Facebook. Somebody gave them a gospel tract or a DVD. Um, we had some people at Twin City Days last weekend handed out over 1,500 DVDs. Okay? We may have 1,500 people who Satan took it away immediately. Trash cans may be full of our DVDs all over the place now. I mean, who knows? It may lay around for a while and finally somebody watch it. I don't know. We'll leave it up. God, it's up to God. God is the one who soweth. Okay? So when they've heard Satan cometh immediately, taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Group number two. Group number one dies and goes to hell. Group number two is a church member. These are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness. That was Demas. They have no root in themselves and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediate for what sake? The word's sake, the Bible's sake, DNA's sake. They're offended. And when they start clamping down on everybody, telling them you've got to have this certain DNA thing going in your body or you can't work, you can't eat, you can't bank, can't do anything. When they start saying that, that's when, it's gonna, that's when we're going to figure out whose side everybody's on. God's going to lead his people. Always lead his people. But they have no root in themselves. Some do it for a moment. For a time afterward, when affliction and persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Verse 18. These are, these are they which are sown among thorns. This is, where, this is where it affects everybody. This is why we have the seasons where we get the plow out and plow up the thorns and dig up the, the stony ground. Get the hoe out and do some hoeing in the garden. Get the thorns out. Get those little prickly weeds out. Get all that. Read your Bible and let God start tearing that stuff out of your life. Okay? And, and it's, you're never going to be done. You are never, ever going to be done finding thorns to dig out of your life. Never. In this world. Keep, you fall down, get back up. That's what godly people do. Okay? That's what godly people do. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody repeats mistakes. Repeat getting up. So these, and they hear the word and the cares of this world. That's, that's Demas. The cares of this world, he loved this present world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things. And that includes everything else. The lust of other things means the lust of anything else other than I want the word of God in me. Entering in, choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. These are your false brethren. Three categories of, well, one of them doesn't even, they don't even care. They're not going to show up to church, but one time they show up for a funeral, wedding, show up maybe once every now and then, and they say, that's not for me, and they're out. And they're never coming back. But you got two groups here of what could very well be church members who will refuse certain areas of the Word of God to have any effect in their life or their own personal sins choking out the word instead of letting the word cut out the sins as God directs, okay? This is where, this is where our habits come in, the addictions and things like that. Let the word of God start getting those things out of you. Get the process going. Fail, get up, do it again, okay? Seasons come around, you got to do it again all over. There, there's another one, you got to pick him up too. And this is where all these seasons come in that I talk about. Now, I'm not going to get into this, but next Sunday morning, we'll talk, we've got some other names on the list of false brethren. Ananias and Sapphira, top of the list. Very famous story in the Bible. This couple, this married couple, that wanted to, they wanted to really show off for everybody. 
just how spiritual they were. And it was all a lie. It was all a lie. Their whole thing was a lie. All right? Let's go to God in prayer. Boy, it's been a good lesson. Amen? That's God doing it out of, weak, out of my weakness. Father, I love you. Thank you, God, for visiting with us today and opening up our eyes and our hearts. And, Father, let this go out and be a blessing all over the world. Let it be a blessing. The people need to hear this, Father. So I entrust this message in your hands. You're the one who gave it. You're the one who sent it forth. You're the one that will bring in the increase. So, Father, we do ask for your blessings now upon your word. We pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen.